Good evening, and welcome to Crisis Communication. Tonight in the class, we are starting a two-part series that deals with personal loss. We'll be looking at some segments that deal with death and dying, and we'll be looking at personal loss in general, and kind of moving back and forth because of the overlap within those particular areas. Uh, in this class, in the two segments, we will be dealing with some of the theoretical materials or more of the theoretical material. And in the next class, we will have Chaplain Virgil Fry from MD Anderson Hospital with us, who will show a videotape about his work at the hospital and will be uh, telling you some stories, personal anecdotes, and uh, addressing the, the practical side of his work and how that ties into the theoretical material that we're addressing tonight. Okay, the first thing I want you to think about, can you think of words that are in our day-to-day -day vocabulary that are sort of death-related words, like a dead-end street? Do you think of, of terms, anything coming to mind? Okay, Jacqueline. It's a sports phrase with uh -huh. sudden death playoff. Good, sudden death playoff, sudden death overtime, good. Okay, let's look at some terms. I just put a sampling uh, up here. <laughs> you picked the first one on the list. <laughs> Good. Jacqueline wins the door prize. <laughs> okay, uh, but because the language permeates our vocabulary probably more than we realize. Sudden death over time, uh, dying breath or a dying gasp, uh, talk a subject to death, you've heard that one. Uh, Dead personality, know anyone like that? Uh, it's a dead issue, I hear that one a lot. Uh, so and so, the Congress killed the legislation. Dead ringer, dead from the neck up. <laughs> dead from the neck down, I don't know. Uh, dead end, dead reckoning, dead weight, dead right, dead serious, political suicide, Graveyard shift, drop dead, dying to meet you, dead ahead, scared to death, dead head, dead beat, crucified the speaker, or a speaker, killing time, dead ahead. I've got that one in there twice. Well, I don't know what I intended to type, but anyway. <laughs> oh. Now, does anything else come to mind? Oh, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, anything else? Okay, well, the, the point here being death-related words are a part of our vocabulary, and we just don't always recognize that. Now, the next question is, what kind of words in our vocabulary do we use to cover up the fact that someone actually is dead? Euphemisms. Oh, Karen and then Robert. Um, passed away. Okay, passed away. I was going to say passed away too, but I was thinking of also, um, like, they're no longer with us. Okay, like, they're maybe no they went on a trip somewhere, but <laughs> yeah, but they're, they're no longer back. with us. That's right. <laughs> and they're not coming back. <laughs> Jacqueline. Well, they say final rest. Also. Okay, final rest. Good. Gone yeah. to their reward. Gone to their reward, <laughs> whatever that may be. Uh, Nancy? Something like uh, Grandma joined Grandpa, who is already dead. Mm -hmm. And when we get to talking about dealing with children and death later on, we'll see sometimes that gets real confusing. They took a trip and never came back. Now we're going to take a trip. Well, I don't want to. <laughs> Robert? They kicked the bucket. Okay, kicked the bucket. I don't have that one on here. Okay, let's put a few of these up and take a look. You've hit several already. Oh. Uh, and sometimes when the lawyer is talking to you about your will or final arrangements or whatever, you may get a term like after you've gone, when you are no longer here, in the event of your inability to provide, <laughs> when you're dead, in other words. <laughs> okay. And some of these you mentioned, passed away, passed over to the other side, wherever that may be, uh, went west. I've never heard anybody say that, but that was... 
won some votes. Uh, when they mean California. You know? <laughs> okay. Uh, expired. I hear that one a lot. The, the patient expired. Is with God. Went to his or her maker. Uh, gone to a well-deserved rest. Or maybe a not-so-well-deserved rest. Went to his or her reward. I think someone mentioned that. Is sleeping with the angels. I don't know, you may think of more. Okay. Uh, but for many people, it's difficult to talk about death and to own up to the fact that, somewhat, that we are dying, that people actually, even though we know this, uh, we, we waltz around the topic, we dance around it, and use euphemisms to find a gentler way to talk about it. Okay, the next little language variation that we have caught me off guard when I first read about this. There's an interesting book. It's getting a little dated now uh, by a man named uh, Richard Kalish called Death, Grief, and Caring Relationships. And you'll see several uh, adaptations from his work and some of the visuals that are going up tonight. But think about... The old nursery rhyme, ring around the rosy, pockets full of posy, ashes, ashes, all fall down. Did you ever stop to think about what that means? Well, Allison, I always do you heard know? that it had to do with um, like a children's disease like scarlet fever and the, the pockets full of posy were their cheeks. Okay, you're on the right track. But I, I know I don't remember all of it. Okay, you got the wrong disease. Oh, okay. Oh, push your mic down. Okay. Okay, as I was saying, I thought it was a childhood disease of some sort where the uh, pockets full of posy were the cheeks full of fever, so to speak, swollen. Okay, you're so. on the right track. Still. <laughs> I, think, I think in one of the English classes here or something, they pointed out that we were talking probably like black plague and that kind of stuff, and they're saying, yeah, that's supposed to be the symptoms of plague. Okay. Uh, but between the two of you, you're doing real well here. I never knew this, and I don't know how many times I sang this little song as a kid. I'll never do it again. Okay, the ring around the rosy refers to the bubonic plague during the Middle Ages, and it erupted as a rose-colored pox with a ring around each one. Pockets full of posy. Death was so common that the people carried flowers to cover the stench as well as flowers for the dead people. Ashes, ashes, there was a lot of cremation taking place uh, to get rid of the bodies because nobody wanted to touch them for fear of contamination. All fall down is a substitution for all fall dead. And apparently, according to Kalish and the people that he's abstracted this from, uh, this was the children's way of making a game out of a very serious condition at the time. And that was one of the ways that they coped with the conditions. So before you go teach that to your children now, I've ruined that nursery rhyme for you. <laughs> oh, but it's an itch. We'll be talking later in the evening about uh, children and how they cope with death and how they see things differently in some instances from the way that adults do, for better and for worse. And this example, at least, is a way that they have adapted language and, and used language in order to uh, cope with a subject that's very difficult uh, in a situation where the conditions were tragic and traumatic. All right, let's look at some types of personal loss. Uh, we're going to find that the grieving process may be very much the same. Oh. What, what are some things people lose that cause you to grieve? Just kind of name them for now and then we'll recap. Nancy? Other than people? Well, okay, people, people. for sure. But Pets. What? Pets, okay. Karen? Well, I'm thinking especially like people who've like been through natural disaster stuff. I mean, they grieve over homes and, and particularly really irreplaceable items, you know, family pictures and or... In Utah, where I where I lived before, it's genealogy. 
Can you lose your genealogy? I, what? Lose all the records of someone's. Oh, you lose the records. And, you know, okay. I mean, someone spent years amassing all this stuff. They've mm -hmm. got it all written down, and and boom, it's wa washed away, and you know, you're back at square one. Okay. Okay. Was your hand? You were going to add that too. Okay. And anything else? All right. Maybe like relationships. Sure. Somehow. A loss. Someone who's important to you that breaks off the relationship. That's a loss and can make you suicidal and we've already done a unit on suicide so we won't bog down in that tonight but we may refer back to that occasionally too. Okay, you got most of these. Uh, loss of belongings when things are stolen. Jacqueline told us about the time your house was just stripped you know and um, the campus police can tell you people get pretty distressed just having a backpack stolen you know but if you've got a term paper in there and a chunk of your grades hanging on it, you may grieve over that. And it's a loss. And anything that's important to you, that's valued to you, you are likely to experience <coughs> grief over it. Now, you know, the more valued it is, the longer the grief period will be. You know, there are probably some spouses that sigh with relief when the other one, I don't uh, Yeah, I think I've known some in my past. <laughs> uh, somebody's grandparents I knew. You know, that was probably a relief. Okay, but loss of belongings, uh, whether it's uh, genealogies, heirlooms, a ring, uh, a friend, a, a lady that's been married, gee, Pat, more than 50 years, I think, lost her engagement ring. And it was gone for, I don't know, a month or so, I think, before she finally found it. I don't even remember where it was now. In the living room, okay. Oh, Ginger knows this woman too. You know, but that was a very stressful thing because that ring has, has been on her finger for more than 50 years. So, but they found it, so that story had a happy ending. Okay. You missed number two. Uh, these aren't in any order, just my number two. Loss of limbs. When people are in accidents and they lose an arm or a leg or two legs, you know, you lose body parts, that's important, and you miss them. And, and you know, and some people handle things better than others, but, but that's an area for grief and adjustment. Or even just the loss of use of the lens. You may still have the lens, but if you have a spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Because for all practical purposes, you've lost them. Right, because they're still there. <clears throat> And if you're around someone that that happens to, then you should expect grief to be part of what's in that process. Okay, death of a child. Well, we've already mentioned loved ones and people close to you. Uh, we lose children through accidents. Uh, we may uh, lose them through sudden infant death syndrome. You know, babies just sometimes die in the crib. Um, you may lose your own parents or I think I put this reference here as aged <coughs> parents. No matter how old you are, it's still not okay if your children die first. And I don't know when that realization kind of came to me, but uh, you know, even if you're 80 and your 60 year old child dies it's still your child and you go through the same it's just not okay and you go through those same grief processes or at least very similar even if it's a young child okay death of a spouse and there are some 80,000 people a year who lose their spouse spouse is more women than men lose their spouses just because right now women tend to live longer. You know, that's a lot of people out there having to adjust, having to learn how to cope. And if you've been married even 30 years, it's an adjustment. But if you've been married 50 or 60 years, just kind of think about that. You know, you've, you're so enmeshed as one Tell them about the, the woman at the gas station. Who oh, stopped. It was a woman. It was just so touching. I went to a gas station that I don't usually go to because it's kind of out of the way, but 
I pulled in there and was filling out my tank, and this, I saw this woman in this lovely, brand new Lincoln town car. It was a lovely car. And she, I saw her drive by, and then she kind of circled around and came back and pulled in. And as I was coming back out from paying, she pulled up and she said, would you please show me how to put gas in my car? My husband died two weeks ago, and I've never had to do this. And you look so kind. I thought you might help me. So I did. I helped her, and I explained it all to her, because she just had never done it. And I stood there till she was done and explained how different gas stations, you know, different kinds of pumps work differently, but how to seal it, because they all have that funny little seal. I didn't want her to squirt gas all over her clothes. But she was so sweet. and I. I we talked about how she had lots of friends who were helping her. She said, but it's just not the same. I keep having these little things pop up that I don't know how to do, like put gas in my car. She said, I don't want to pay 25 or 30 cents more a gallon to have somebody do it for me. I should be able to do this. It was just so sweet. She was so brave, but so terrified. You know, and, and it's those little things. I mean, I can remember the first time I had to pump gas. There wasn't a crisis. It was just I was tired of paying full price, and you know the gas wars were on, and are over, I guess, and it was time to learn to pump it. But, you know, some of you grow up on computers, some of you grow up pumping gas, and you, you don't even remember hardly when you did it the first time. But there are a lot of things that when you've been married 30, 40, 50 years, you've just sorted out those tasks, and he does these and she does those, and, and things just flow better if you keep doing certain things. You know, and then there's some of us that are so short that even if we get the hood of our car up, we can't reach <laughs> the dipsticks to check the fluid levels. <laughs> you know, and I know a number of folks like that. <laughs> you know, but where is that water cut off out in the yard? I mean, I know we've got one, but I've never had to turn it off. Okay, uh, loss of loved ones through suicide, disease, accidents. Uh, we'll be touching on more of those things. Okay, loss of a relationship, Robert mentioned, and that's good. Uh, I mean, it's not good to lose it, but uh, good to note that that's significant. Loss of health, that's something you lose. You know, those creaks and moans and groans set in, and then eventually some serious things happen. Uh, loss of a pet. Yeah, let me, uh, let's come back to that in about half a minute. You can go ahead and find the letters. Uh, loss of job or money. If you or your spouse have been CEO of something big and important and wonderful and you're suddenly unemployed, <coughs> uh, I had a person do a term paper in this class once on all the ramifications of that because her husband lost a high-paying job and all the rippling effect that took place there. Uh, loss of success. You know, how many superstars commit suicide or at least go around depressed because they aren't who they once were, or others go around being depressed because they never got success in the first place. Okay, uh, let's go back to loss of a pet for a minute, and this is as good a place as any to tie into that because some of you would say, that's no big deal, and you're probably the people who don't own a cat or a dog. But if you are a bird or any other, a boa constrictor, <laughs> you know. But if you have a pet, and if you're a person who appreciates pets, those pets become a part of your family. You know, the naming of the pet is just, as, it may in some instances be more complicated than the naming of the children. Oh. And those, those pets become a part of your everyday life, and dogs especially tend to live much longer than cats. I know of a few people whose cats have made it 10 or 12 years, once in a while, 15 or so. 18 and still going? Or no? Okay. I didn't know if that was. I know you wouldn't know 18 was the number, would you? <laughs> Never mind. Some brain cramp. Vacation will do that to you. Uh, but the pet becomes a member of the family and, and the implications are significant. And if you have friends who have lost their pets, then you need to be aware of that. Even if pets don't mean anything to you, you need to be accepting and aware that the grief process is going to take place in these other people. And if you think it's stupid, then you probably just should give yourself some space, or if not, then be prepared to assist and cope. But uh, Ginger's family recently lost a pet that you hadn't had for very long. What, can you tell them about it or will you cry? <laughs> We had this beagle named Rocky, and 
he was about as dumb as dogs as can be. Dumb, <laughs> but really cute. But really cute and very sweet, but really stupid. But, you know, that's just kind of how beagles are. Anyway, he got out of the yard and got hit by a car, but he looked like he'd been attacked by an animal because he had these huge rips in his skin. And so my son found him, and it was his dog. And he brought him in, and he handled it very well. He came and got me. I mean, he was crying, but he came and got me, and my son is eight. And, and so I... Here was this dog bleeding and with huge scrapes. At and 9.30 at night. Yeah. Or late. It was late. And so I called Martha. And, and we were on the phone when Alex yeah. brought him in. And, and we called an emergency vet clinic. And I took the dog there. And they said it would be more than $500 to fix him. And then they weren't sure if they could. So we had him uh, fixed up for the night and brought him home. And then took him to our regular vet the next day. Who said, oh, no, he was not attacked. He was hit by a car and the dog died. Um, that day. So my husband went and got another dog for Alex before he got home from school. Because he'd already lost another dog two years before and it was he's only eight. So we're trying to be really <clears throat> supportive and caring and, and have him be excited about the new puppy when he got home. And that seemed to work, although he has grieved over Rocky some. But about a week and a half later, I got these letters in the mail for Alex from his cousins. Because my mom, I told my mom about it and she told my sister. And so her daughters wrote um, letters to Alex and I told them that they'd be on TV. I would read their letters. One of them is from his cousin, Christina. And she says, Dear Alex, I heard your dog got hit by a car. That's very sad. It was so slippery outside, we didn't have school. So we went to the YMCA, rented movies, then came home and watched the Flintstones. We watched The Mask and then the Flintstones. They were both good. I bet you are sad about your dog. I'm sad too. Love, Christina. She was trying to make him think about something else. She's in fourth grade. And this is from his cousin, Tricia. Dear Alex, I feel sad that your dog got hit by a car. I know how it feels because my dog, Odie, got hit by a car, too. I'm very sorry that your dog died. Your cousin, Tricia. Which is just really sweet that little kids don't cry more. <laughs> oh, I can I'm handle okay. this. I knew this was scary. Can handle this better than sometimes we do as adults. But they were very appropriate. I was really proud of them. And they got right, they didn't have to talk around the subject, you know, your dog hasn't gone over the great divide or <laughs> crossed <laughs> over to the other side. Your dog died and it's really sad. Yeah. And, and they're better at using direct language often than we are. You know, we probably say, I'm really sorry you don't have your dog anymore. I know you'll miss it. You know, I'm sorry your dog died. You know, mine did too. And, but they identify, and we'll see as, as we talk more about children later on, that learning to cope with the loss of a pet is an important phase in learning to cope with bigger losses later on. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> when my cat, I had a cat that was so dog ugly when we got it, we called it Quasimodo. But <laughs> <laughs> that I had this, this cat, well my husband that was killed in a car wreck got this cat and brought it home and it was like our little baby. And um, when he was killed, our Irish setter was, was trying to pine to death, and I had to pump him up to life. And I went through all this, and I still had our cat. And I took our cat to the vet. This is on his 18th year, and much later on, much later on. And the veterinarian said he was very, he was very surprised to see me crying and mourning, and I was really having a hard time with it because he was such a buddy. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is cat could fetch and speak, and I mean it was really crazy. Anyway, um, he said usually he had uh, older people that he has to bring them out to the other room, and he has uh, his receptionist talk to them. So apparently, they they are used to this at the vet clinics mm -hmm. to talk to people t that are bereaving over their animals. But he says it's usually a widow or uh, that. Oh, I just this. burst into tears yeah. over one because I did. I had no idea the cat would die. He was having trouble breathing, and it never occurred to me what the problem might be. And it was feline Luke, even though he'd had the test and so forth. You know, and that was, and the cat was, I don't know, a year old. And if I talk much about that, I will cry. But the quick fix for that was to go straight to the SPCA the next day and get a new fluffy cat to replace that one. You know, to get, and this was the right approach that you had used too, because. The, the problem with people is you can't just pop right out and get a new husband or a new girlfriend or a new child or, you know, 
Well, I guess maybe some people do, but in an attempt to cope. Allison? Well, I was just going to share, because um, I kind of disagree with you about being able to just go out and get another cat. I mean, I mean, I'm sure that works fine for some people, but like for me, myself, Losing an animal is like losing a best friend, and we. Oh, had, and I could cry. Right, over I that understand. Cat now, but so yeah, this was a diversion. Right, I understand, and but it wouldn't work with me. I mean, right. I'd be sitting there going, "Oh, you're real cute, but you know." But where's my other? Baby? But my mom, you know, there's a lot of guilt associated with pet loss too, especially if you accidentally hurt one of your own animals. Oh and yeah. My mother, when a couple of years back, um. We have four cats now. At the time, we only had two. But she had left a window open because it was spring and nice air coming in. And she fell asleep on the couch. And the cat had walked out on the windowsill. And she didn't know it. And she shut the window. And the cat had never been outside before. And to keep warm, um, our cat's name was Penny. She went into not our parking space, but the car next to us and got inside the engine to keep warm. And unfortunately, she was killed when we found her like two days later. But my mother to this day has not forgiven herself right. for that at all. So, yeah. it's, you know. Well, we have a pet cemetery in our backyard. You know, and we've buried birds and gerbils and cats and <laughs> one dog. The current dogs are too large. But, you know, years ago when, when one daughter was probably six or seven years old, she dropped the gerbil house on a baby gerbil. And I mean, it didn't even have hair yet, you know, and you would think, who could grieve over something the size, a third of my little finger? You know, but she accidentally killed the baby gerbil and cried and cried and cried. And it's the same thing, you know, we feel great guilt when we've, if we've contributed in any way. And we're really good at blaming ourselves. And if there's any way we can make ourselves responsible, we will. And I'll. I remember the morning I went out and I checked into the car because I was checking into the car and I backed out of the garage and I ran over our cat because he was so stupid. He came and laid under the wheels of the car and I just screamed because it was my daughter's cat and came in and called my dad to come over because I just he was just stiff, just almost instantly. It was just, and I called the school because I was go taking my daughter to school, getting ready. To to take my daughter to school and so I called to let them know we'd be late and this was the worst response I have ever had to a death and I called and I said we're going to be late I just ran over our cat da 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 and the lady said oh well does your wa daughter want hot lunch today and tomorrow or not <laughs> is that stupid I said what? I don't know <laughs> I just don't know well you have to decide no she doesn't <laughs> I said, fine I'll make a decision but I just went over my cat, lady. You know, I mean, I was sobbing. And but you can tell that's a person without a pet, with no experience, you know, no emotional experience in dealing with something like this. I could have heard her. <laughs> <laughs> then she wouldn't know what pain <laughs> feels like. <laughs> but she was a mile away, and she was lucky. <laughs> God saved her that day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I know that day I did tears for my vet. You know, he just shook his head and, and he said, this is the hardest part of my job. And that caught him off guard, too. You know, maybe he was expecting only little old ladies. I don't know. But there, there are lots of ways that we lose things. And the strangest things are important to different people. You know, it may be a dish that belonged to your great-grandmother that you got stories told about it, and then somehow it gets broken. Karen? My mother, um, I've never understood quite why she did this, but it was after my father passed away, and she was kind of cleaning up things because she knew she was going to have to move from where she was living. It was where she was living was kind of related to his, the job he w had had at the time. It was, they were living on like a top secret military base because he was, he was a civilian employee, but it was so remote that everyone lived there and everyone shopped on the base and everything else. So she knew when he died, well, she's going to have to leave. And, and for whatever reason, decided in that process to dispose of a lot of things. And I was really kind of horrified when I found out that among the things she chose to dispose of were all the Christmas ornaments that we had hung on the tree for all the years I was growing up. And so I have to admit every Christmas that I still feel a little twinge because I remember 
mm -hmm. those ornaments. There were ornaments that I looked forward to hanging on the tree that were special. Some of them were ones that, like, her brother had sent when he was serving in Poland with the State Department. I mean, you know, they were unique and special, and, and, and you know, and as I say, and I, so, I mean, it, it's not something, it's not a big thing, but yet, yeah, I have to admit, I guess I do grieve a little over those, crisp, those ornaments, kind of thinking, how could you, mother? Yeah. Well, my cat broke a cheap dish from my mother's house. I don't know, several weeks ago now, but I, uh, uh, and I mean, she probably paid two dollars for it forty years ago. But I got the super glue out and stuck it back together and put some fake flowers in it, you know, just because it reminds me of that little corner of her house, you know. And there was that emotional response to the loss. And it's very difficult when parents sell things and and if they move from the family house, you know, they're no longer able to take care of it and they go into apartments or retirement homes. That's where all the memories were. And and that's a kind of loss. Well, there's the woman there's a woman in one of my classes and her husband works in South America and he was home this week. And she was talking to me after class day he left this morning and her seven year old had gone in to the closet and said, Mommy, can't you smell Daddy on this shirt right here? She said it was so hard for her, and her daughter wanted to take the shirt to school with her, and, I, and she said, I can't let her do that. I said, no, but she can have it with her at home, and she can sleep with it, and it's okay. Because, I mean, he'll be back. He just comes back and forth a lot. But she was worrying because her seven-year-old was grieving. I said, oh, no, that's okay. That's, that's okay. And it may be why some adults even hang on to their blankets and so forth. Allison? <laughs> I was just agreeing with you, that's oh. all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I know, you know, after my grandson came to visit, he's 14 months old, maybe 15 <laughs> months now. And, uh, you know, there were baby smells in the house, the, the smell of baby powder, baby diapers, <laughs> you know. But, but, <laughs> but those smells lingered <laughs> more the baby powder, you know. And, and those things carry on and think, oh, oh, they're gone. You know, they'll be back in May. But. Okay, let's move along. But these are kinds of things that people lose that can have great impact on them. Okay, now there's some kind of odds and ends of terms that we need and thoughts we need to sort out. Um, let's see if I can get this in better focus here. Some of this we'll be talking more about tonight. And some we'll be talking about more in our next class uh, when the chaplain is here, but just so we're kind of together on some terminology and thoughts. From the Kalish book, I just kind of pulled some random things out that I thought was interesting. It's important to note that aging and dying are not the same thing. I mean, you're on a, a dying trajectory from the time that you're born, you know, and it ultimately leads to death. But just because you're getting older, doesn't mean you're nearly dead. You know, there, there are various stages of this, okay? Aging is certainly not equal to being dead. And there are some people who, who sort of assume that if all your hair has turned gray or that if you're in a uh, wheelchair or using a walker or something, you're, you're as good as dead. And while that might seem true of a few people you know, uh, you know, it, it's not an inherent correlation. Uh, much aging produces gains, not losses. <coughs> and I, I couldn't put my hands on the book, but long ago I, I saw a, a book that had an account of all the people who accomplished great and wonderful things after the age of 70, who made great discoveries. Uh, you know, some of Einstein's best work was done in his latter years. But books that were written, great paintings that were done, uh, there's a lot of good stuff that comes with aging, that may come with aging. So the aging process is not directly related to the dying process, that the older you get, the, dead, the nearer to total death you are. We'll look at those terms more completely in a minute. Uh, as you age, resistance to disease may be lower, but that's also true of infants babies have a very low resistance to disease. And we wouldn't say that an infant is nearly dead simply because it has a lowered resistance to age, to disease. 
Okay. <laughs> oh, don't, just listen to what I mean, not what I say. <laughs> okay, yeah, Nancy got it completely. <laughs> That's good. Okay, recovery from accidents may be slower, but that doesn't mean you're dying either. It just means you have a slower recovery period. And pain may or may not be related to dying. I had a very interesting paper in this class written several years ago on chronic pain uh, by a woman who'd been in an auto accident who experienced, and she wasn't very old, you know, probably mid to late 20s, which looks good by my definition. Uh, but it was a chronic pain sufferer, had been to pain clinics, eventually dropped out of school and, and moved out of state. Uh, back where her parents were so that she could have assistance with that. But, you know, you don't die from pain. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but, you know, you can be in pain for decades and you won't die from pain. So, you know, it may or may not be related to the dying process. Okay, let's get a few vocabulary words here that you'll at least know what Chaplain Fry and I mean when we use these words. And you may or may not choose to use them this way. Okay, dying, dead, and death are three interconnected words and we probably need to sort them out. Dying is the process leading to death that begins at birth. Dead and there are different definitions of this. I mean, there's biologically dead and clinically dead and so forth. But when your biological functions cease, uh, when you're devoid of physical life, uh, when there's a separation of the spirit from the body, then most people would agree you're dead. And death, as I'm using it and many authors, speakers do, death is the transition point from dying to being dead. And then there's, there's different interpretation depending on uh, different religious beliefs, different metaphysical beliefs about what it means to be dead. Whether your spirit separates from your body, we're going to talk about near-death experiences a little later on, uh, just because they're kind of fun to explore. So dying is a process that leads to death, beginning at birth. Dead is the cessation of biological functions so that you're devoid of physical life. And this, depending on your beliefs, may involve the separation of spirit from body. And death is the transition point from dying to being dead. Okay, let's go ahead and get some more terms here. Next week, even more, we'll be dealing with grief and bereavement and mourning. But it may help since we're just kind of to get all your vocabulary for this unit in one place. Grief is usually interpreted to be the intense emotion that's felt when someone is deprived of a loved one or of a significant object, especially through death. And it may involve a healing process after a significant loss. Uh, I think you'll hear from the chaplain, and, and certainly I would say, that grief is a very healthy thing. And when people bottle all the emotion up inside and don't let it out, generally that's not good. Now, there seem to be a few people who can handle that. They may, what they may be doing is going off privately and grieving. And, and doing their sobbing and their, their serious emotional outlet at that point. But the person who does not overtly grieve at all may end up being very stressed and have a much longer recovery period after some kind of significant loss. Okay, bereavement is a word that describes the event itself, the whole process of being in grief of grieving and being in mourning. Uh, you'll see on the next one, mourning is more a public expression. Grief is a more personal one. Bereavement 
is the state of being in the condition of having this loss or deprivation. And especially we use it when it refers to uh, loss by death. But bereavement is a state and grief is an emotion. And then mourning, we usually use that term to <clears throat> refer to the public expression of one's loss. Do you put on, does the woman put on black clothes and a veil, uh, somber ex, uh, expressions, whatever. Uh, generally, anyway, let's read through it. Public expression of one's loss, generally from, it occurs from the news of a death until the time of interment. Rituals may vary according to one's spirituality and culture. And if we have time later on, we'll talk about some different cultural uh, responses to death because uh, and, and different types of mourning that occur across different cultures because they're, they're considerably varied. And uh, particularly a number of them are very different from uh, the American typical experience. Any question about these terms? Okay, so we've got dying and dead and death and grief and bereavement and mourning. Okay, four more terms and then we're going to, going to move on. Okay, in some instances when we've got this grief process occurring, we've got someone in bereavement, uh, there may be a status of learned hopelessness where the person feels like nothing will make a difference. You just, you know, you've lost someone very, very special and significant to you, and it just looks like life will not, cannot go on. And back earlier in the semester, we talked about the degree of mobility of a person in crisis, and whether they're able to function or not. And a person who is in this hopelessness state may have a very low degree of mobility. You may also have uh, learned helplessness, and this ties into the may tie into the aging process. The person relinquishes control and responsibilities, and so they believe they're helpless, and there there may need to be a training period or a retraining so that the person learns that they can function, much like the woman at the gasoline pump. You know, she was physically able to pump gasoline, but she recognized that she needed to learn how to do that, and she was able to take the appropriate steps uh, to cope with that. So she was not in a hopelessness. She was sad, but she wasn't hopeless, and she wasn't continuing to be helpless. But sometimes it takes other people in the individual's environment to take them by the hand figuratively or literally to say you can do this. You know, you are capable of walking out in the front yard and getting the newspaper or it's now time for you to drive your car to the grocery store and purchase a few basic items or whatever it may be. But we learn, sometimes there's a, a learned hopelessness, sometimes there's a learned helplessness that occurs. Okay, uh, sometimes in, in reacting to uh, the news of a death, you may get what's called, uh, by Kalish and others, a brittle death denial. Or uh, if the, you may find this in a person who is dying. If the person's been told that they're perhaps dying of cancer, a long-term disease, they may either deny the facts or the implications of the situation. Uh, maybe you're going in for surgery to have a malignant growth removed, <coughs> but you simply lie to yourself and say, this is a benign tumor that they're going to take out. 
Well, that's a brittle denial. It's a blatant uh, denial. Okay, or the implications of the situation. If um, uh, I've been told that I have intestinal cancer and one year to live, and yet I go into the doctor and I say, I keep having these abdominal cramps. I don't understand this. You know, well, that's a, a brittle denial of the implication because the implication of a long-term illness like this, or you know, make, make it a different disease, muscular dystrophy, and, and I don't understand why I'm having trouble. You know, I'm, I'm increasingly less coordinated and I'm confused by that. Well, that's, that's an unhealthy kind of denial. That's a brittle death denial, even though death may be way down the line. Okay, adaptive death denial may be good. Uh, this is when the person recognizes that the disease they have is terminal, but they haven't given up. You know, I'm not through fighting yet. You know, I'm, I'm not done fighting this disease. And so this can be healthy. It may even help the person uh, to emphasize the opportunities that they have left. And I've known of some patients at MD Anderson, for example, who went into their final coma denying the fact that this was, that the end was imminent. You know, knowing that the, the lymphoma or whatever might ultimately uh, cause their death, but not believing that today was going to be the day. And that ability to keep on fighting has sustained a number of people over time. Any question about terms? Okay, let's move along. Okay, we have a little fun next. What's the function of a funeral? Karen? Personal theory here. Uh -huh. It's really, it's obviously not the person in the casket. I, so, <laughs> far, so far as we have any, you know. The best we can tell. Yeah. We, we, we haven't been given any report of, of, of any benefit to them. They haven't come back to tell us about it. So we have to, you know, it's really, I think it's a, a sort of a public marker to say, um, this has really happened, and, and it's a way to kind of, you know, and you kind of have people there supporting you while you, you know, recognize this is it. It's happened, and, and things are going to be different hereafter. Okay, good. Nancy? There's a lot, I mean, grief is a lonely thing, and it isn't so much that uh, other people can take that away from you, but just the presence around you of people that or grieving with you is comforting. Mm -hmm. It's a very comforting, reassuring thing. Sometimes you don't realize how many friends you have and how many people really care about you until a funeral and, and the things that are associated with it. Good. Anybody want to add anything? I have more on my list. Ginger? A, uh, a relative. I'm not even sure my husband's nephew's wife. And <laughs> I'm not sure what that makes Your niece-in-law? Yeah. <laughs> Leslie. She's wonderful. Anyway, her father died suddenly. And after the, after the funeral, she came up to me and she said, she just stood there and she said, did you see all those people who loved my daddy? I mean, it was so touching because she just didn't know. And there were hundreds of people. I mean, it was a standing room only funeral because he, he was, I don't know, maybe 45 or 50, he wasn't very old, and she was just amazed at all the people who were there and just really touched. And so it was neat for her, even though it was really difficult for everyone. It was a special tribute to him that she could recognize and appreciate. Right. Jacqueline? This is morose, but um, on the flip side of that, they can be status symbols as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Unfortunately, I was subject to going to a funeral that was a production, and they literally had, and for the next song, we'll have so-and-so sing, da-da-da, and I'm going, and then we had a poetry reading, and then we had a, some sort of dramatization of something he wrote, and I'm going, when will this end? It was like a play. It was the most, <laughs> incredible, <laughs> most incredible thing I ever saw, but it was like a status production. He was uh, a... Very comfortable, well-to-do person, 
This happened about 10 years ago. I've never gotten over that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll remember it. That's what they wanted you to do. They wanted him to live in your memory. Karen? And of course, there's sort of the classic um, thing of appeasing guilt. I mean, that's, there is the classic thing of that the mafia was always known for wonderfully elaborate funerals of the people they've done in. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at some of them. You got some. Okay. Uh, and I just ask initially, is it emotional closure or a financial ripoff? You know, and, and I won't take a stand here on public television. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, I think you have to, each person has to answer that for themselves and decide if they have the money for a grand production or not. Okay. You know, are they exploiting the vulnerable, bereaved? Is embalming useful or grotesque? There are some cultures that embalm. There are others that do not. Um, you know, culturally, we are into a pattern. OK, uh, but some of the things that funerals may do, depending on your beliefs and so forth, uh, may provide a rite of passage for the soul. Uh, there are some who believe that the soul cannot move on to do what it's supposed to do next metaphysically until uh, the funeral is complete. Uh, it provides a way to dispose of the body rather than just having it body bagged and hauled off at the hospital. Uh, it declares the deceased societal status and we just got an example of that. But you know, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy funeral with uh, all the trappings and eternal torches and these kinds of things. Okay, and as Karen was saying, and, and probably the most, I think probably the most important, it helps the survivors acknowledge the loss so that, that there is a marking point, there is a visible overt act uh, that forces this acknowledgement. Okay, it may help survivors grieve. There are some people who really don't turn loose emotionally and enter the grief process until the funeral itself, or you know, but it, it's a cathartic kind of thing. Oh. And then six, that may reaffirm the ability of society to exist after the loss of a member. <coughs> You know, even if you're the president of the United States, life goes on. And there's something about the closure uh, with the funeral ceremonies that may help the people to realize, okay, you know, this is a marking point, but this is how we go on from here in dealing with this. <coughs> and this, like other things, is, has varying degrees of helpfulness uh, for different people. You will find within different families that, they ha that families manage grief differently. <coughs> and culturally, this varies. You know, some cultures are very open and emotional. Uh, others are far less so. Mm -hmm. Great story. I'm going to steal it right off of one of the professors. I don't know if she's still teaching here. Sheila Scheinberg um, used to teach um, introductory psychology, uh, sociology here. Mm -hmm. And she talked about the fact that she grew up Jewish, but she was growing up in New Orleans. And they lived in a neighborhood that was, you know, fairly racially mixed enough that she experienced a lot of very typical black New Orleans jazz funerals. So I went through a lot of these as a kid and hadn't lost anybody in her family. So she really kind of got used to that pattern of, yeah, you pay these, you play the long, slow, mournful songs all the way to the cemetery. But when you on the way back, it's, you start picking up the party music because now it's time the to say. The saints are marching in. And, and, and be kind of glad that you're, you know, <coughs> you're still alive and stuff. And so this is kind of, even in spite of the fact that cultural differences from her family, this is kind of what she said, what she grew up with to a large degree. First funeral hits in her own family. Everything's fine, she says, until, until they're coming back from the cemetery. Rest of the family wants to go home and sit around and be mournful, and she is now sort of primed for where's the party. And her hor the rest of her family's reaction is they are horrified that what is wrong with you? But she said, hey, I, all the other funerals I've been to, it's now, you know, so party where's time. the music, you know? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think one sort, well, the Kalish book suggested that Greeks and Italians are much more open, have a much stronger 
uh, release. When, I don't know if any of you can remember when John Kennedy died, one or two, <laughs> you know, uh, but the emotional response around the world, can you remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you old enough to remember that? Okay. Uh, but the emotional response around the world was such that in some cultures, the people were wailing and grieving far more openly than many Americans simply because that was, the, I mean, I remember being sad, being teary-eyed, but I didn't go all to pieces, you know, and regardless of what your political affiliation, I know I've got a mix out here in the audience, uh, you know, maybe that's why I didn't go all to pieces, I don't know. Okay, um, but there, the, in South India, there's a tribe of K-O-T-A-S, Kotas, Kotas, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, and they have two funerals. And the first funeral marks the, the fact that the individual is dead. And the second funeral, which I think is about a year later, is when the spirit actually leaves the earthly realm and goes on to wherever it's going. And so they have two funerals, and, and that's what they believe is taking place uh, and so forth. I had a student in the crisis class one semester who said, uh, was, who was Vietnamese and whose father had been killed in the Vietnam War and said that her father's body was placed on the carpet in their hut and the children slept beside the corpse and that was normal and at the funeral I don't know if it was the next day soon I'm sure the the wife threw herself into the grave and that that's a typical thing that the the bereaved spouse particularly the woman, throws herself into the grave and then friends remove her, but this is all part of the ceremony of, of how this is done. Now, I think it was Hindu uh, that, I don't know if it's always done or, or sometimes done, but there was at least some practice there of burning the dead man's widow in order to enhance his memory. Is that India? Okay. Oh. So, you know, just lots of cultural variations, uh, what final rites are required and so forth vary according to various religious groups. I know, I think it's Methodist Hospital that has about 15 pages of instructions, or not instructions, but information that the chaplaincy office there has so that doctors and nurses know uh, based, and it's why they ask you your religious affiliation when you check into the hospital, because they want to do things the way you would want them to be done. And, and here's a paragraph on all these various flavors of religions so that you know, does this person need uh, a priest to d provide last rites? Is this, you know, it, does it matter how the body is handled uh, once you're dead? In some cultures, you know, the, the arms have to be placed a certain way or not placed a certain way. There was a comment somewhere. Jacqueline, okay. That brought to mind something else. I had oh. to put that aside. Um, uh, you were talking about the rituals. It, the Egyptians, they put the, the priest, the high priest, and, and the wife also, and the cats. But uh, I went and to If one, you got a pyramid, the whole thing You go. Right? <laughs> um, uh, and his boats and everything else, mm -hmm. right, to send him to heaven. But I went to a funeral one time where the widow was wearing bright red. She had a bright red dress on. And everybody was appalled because you're expected to wear black. Mm -hmm. yeah, something dark and she didn't understand why everybody was sort of just whispering and scuttling around and it didn't come up until later and she said but that's what my husband asked me to do he loved me in red but people didn't get over that they were very, they thought it was just insulting to her husband mm -hmm. and I guess it would have been nice if there had been a way to communicate that to the audience Although there's a part of me that says it's none of their business, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's your funeral. Yeah. You know. But if you have specific instructions, if you care, you know, at this point in my life, it's no big deal to me. But for some people, it's very important what songs are sung, which people do which things, you know, and... If, if that's important to you, you need to write it down somewhere and give it to someone, give it to several people. I started to say give it to someone much younger than you, but that may or may not mean anything. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> put, it, put it in some... <laughs> Thank so you, Judy. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, car wrecks and whatever's uh, 
Was your hand up, Kara? Yeah, I oh, was. My, my mother did write. I mean, I, I don't know. We went, we kind of felt it was kind of morbid and kind of told her that many times. My mother did spend. I mean, she wasn't in any, you know, I mean, years before she passed away and years before, I mean, with no reason to think, expect any kind of sudden death or anything, my mother did spend a lot of time carefully planning out what was going to happen at her funeral, what song, yes, exactly mm -hmm. what you were saying. And she, and, you know, carefully arranged things. And there's nothing things. wrong with that if that's important to you. Yeah, I, I, we all thought it was a little strange, but, you know, as I say, we said, okay, Mom, we'll, we'll do that. And, and, you know, I don't know if we even were able to locate all the copies of that, but I remembered enough of it. She had talked enough about it that I remembered, like, yeah, I think we need to have this song, you know. But um, I was, you were talking about some of the rituals and stuff, but I know that... <clears throat> I had friends who served missions and stuff, so they spent a couple of years in like Spain and Italy, and they said they figured they could make a fortune if they went to Spain and sold black clothes to the widows, because traditions there required that, depending on how close the person is to you, was how long you had to wear black, and if it was a widow, it might be like five years or something. So some of those little ladies are wearing black, you know, or, or, or a fathers. Lot of black or clothes. I mean, it could be five or ten mm -hmm. years. So I mean, yeah, I think with all those people dying and a lot of people needing black, it's like, they said, for one thing, you, you walk around and that's almost all the little ladies are wearing black for somebody all the time. And so they figured they could just make a fortune. They could just sell black clothes. Hmm, that's interesting. Rob? I was going to say, it's just the opposite in East Asia. Uh, you don't want to wear black to funerals. You want to wear white because white is their color for mourning. So uh, that's one thing that I learned doing my research project for this class is that um, that the white color, this girl was telling me this the other day in an interview, she said, if you wear, I, I'm not going to ever wear white in my hair, because if I wear white in my hair, that's the symbol for, like, death. So it would be like a curse. If she walks around on the campus with something, like a white bow in her hair or something. So it's one thing, it's something I never realized before about the East Asian, like chi traditional Chinese. So. Yeah, I think probably the closest we get to that on Mother's Day, if your mother's living, you wear a red flower, and if deceased, white. But Jacqueline? That's supposed to be because white is the absence of all colors and black is the presence of all. But they have uh, serve, uh, they, at the funeral homes now, they have uh, uh, programs where you can go in and plan your own funeral. Mm -hmm. Shortly after I had buried my husband, about almost a year later, they sent me all this literature on how to plan my own. Oh. And, and <laughs> didn't you tell me you know what you were doing? I just didn't return it. <laughs> but, but they do. They have, and quite, as I understand, Quite a few people do use it. Okay, let's move along. Uh, there was some fun stuff that I was thinking, just so we, and so everything's not so heavy tonight. Uh, my minister looked at this. I'm not sure he appreciated the list too much. Uh, roles of ministers at funerals. Kalish says you're likely to get any sort of combinations, and please don't name any people by name here, but you may have seen some of these. You know, uh, for some, the young preacher doesn't necessarily mean young, but, but the, for some, uh, the funeral is an opportunity to preach a sermon and, and save all the people in the audience. Uh, the smarmy gland hand, handler, I can say this, glad hander, you know, just uh, the greasy, sleazy type that's out there shaking all the hands that you think probably should be running for public office or shouldn't be running for public office, but maybe. I don't know, you know whether you'll see these types anywhere or not. Uh, I did put on here they're adapted from Kalish, from the death, grief, and caring relationships. But uh, the super evangelist, the Bible banger, uh, the enthusiastic eulogist, you know, sometimes the family tree just seems to go on indefinitely, on, and the, the tributes are endless, you know, people from work and people from the family and uh, the neighbors and the dog catcher, the veterinarian. <laughs> I don't know. You know, everybody has to stand up and say some glowing remarks. And again, if this is, and I, while I'm making light of some of this, if this is what you want and it's what your family wants and it's what meets your needs, then that's appropriate. Okay? And then finally, uh, the sincere shepherd, the the person who does it, the, who conducts, the minister who conducts the funeral the way you believe it should be done, who does it with empathy and understanding and credibility and renders a, a legitimate service to the people. Any types you want to add or comment?
comments. You know, I think one, it, it's useful if you can identify for people whom you would like to have do a service for you. I think it's really awkward when you have a person who doesn't go to church anywhere and then the family goes to some minister and asks them to conduct a funeral and they go, who is this person? It's like trying to write a letter of recommendation for a student whose name I don't even know, let alone know anything about them. And I think of at least one instance where uh, the elderly lady hadn't been to church probably in 20 or 30 years and one of the relatives got her minister to conduct the funeral. But I felt really sorry for this man. You know, he had to interview family members to find out who, who is this deceased individual. What can I say that's the truth that's positive? And so if, if you are not a church-going type, then it might be appropriate to figure out or make some suggestions about how the family might handle that. There was a friend of mine who died, um, and she, her daughter was the same age as, as my daughter. And I went to her funeral, and she was a very religious woman and had been very involved with her church. But you certainly could not tell from the words that the minister said. He didn't talk about, the person that he talked about was not the person any of the rest of us knew. It was obvious that he had not really paid any attention to this woman and had no idea who she was. He talked about the most obscure, bizarre things that had absolutely nothing to do with who she was. It was, it was just the most uncomfortable. And then there was another person I know who died, and he had been raised Catholic but had not been to the Catholic Church for a long time and had been quite a sinner. And so when the priest got up to, to speak the eulogy, he put the responsibility on everyone who was there to pray this young man out of purgatory and into heaven. And just went on and on for about 20 minutes about that. And we were all sitting there going, this guy's a cocaine dealer. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm not sure how much prayer that's going to take. You know? <laughs> I'm just being real busy for a long time. <laughs> like, well, you can stand up there and try to make that our responsibility, but something probably should have happened before. <laughs> you know? I don't know. It was just, I've never been to one like that. It's kind of peculiar. Want to top that story? I've known some real interesting <laughs> people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nancy. On a different note, uh, when my aunt died, my cousin is uh, she, and she's a Methodist minister, and did not know her, but she was so sensitive that when she talked to all the sisters and siblings in the family, that when she delivered the eulogy and the funeral, you just felt like my aunt was right there. You know, and so a lot of that, I think, the sincere shepherd depends yeah, on that no matter how much they know the person or don't know the person. And those people are out there. And I had a novel experience, one at, at a kind of church retreat camp. They, they needed, as part of the object lesson, they preached my funeral. And, and, I mean, they told me ahead of time, you know, we need, and, and Ginger was there when this happened. But it's a real novel experience. Oh, horrible. I hate it. oh she bawled her eyes out. The whole you know, time, but, she was but lying the, there. I knew she know, was alive. You know, but I'm crying. I'm like, God, I didn't know these people like me this much. You know, <laughs> teenagers went out and picked little wildflowers and brought them in and laid them on me, you know, this kind of stuff. But it was real interesting to hear my minister preach my funeral and be listening. You know, we'll get to near-death experiences in a little while. You know, you may or may not be present at your own funeral. I don't know. Uh, but just even if you do this as a reflective self-exercise, you know, if you were listening to your own funeral, what would they likely be saying about you? And, of course, they really drug this out and milked it for all it was worth, and people gave little personal statements and uh, so forth. And, and it fit the lesson at the time, but we were all pretty relieved when the other minister came over and said, arise, you know, okay, <laughs> enough of this. Okay, uh, real quickly, let's look at some roles of family members. And, you know, families are really strange things, particularly at funerals. Uh, you may have the coping griever, and I think the way this is used here, it's, it's almost the melodramatic part. 
yeah, with, with quotes, you know, oh, how are we going to go on? How are we going to survive? I can't believe that, you know, it, it can get pretty histrionic and, and melodramatic sometimes. Uh, other times you have a legitimate, most of these are kind of poking fun uh, at, at the extreme types you see. The perplexed novice, there's some people that just don't know what's happening. I mean, they've never been to a funeral before. They don't understand the ramifications of what's taking place. Uh, there are those with uncontrollable emotion. And, and, sometimes, and I hesitated to put these up here because some of these things are legitimately true. There are some people who are grieving so much that they have to be tranquilized in order to cope. And then there are others that I sometimes wonder if they're just kind of wailing in order to call attention to themselves. And you have to make your own judgments about that. I've certainly seen the stone wall type. I've been to some funerals where the immediate family did not shed a tear. Even though you believe that this was a loving and close family, everybody was just supposed to hang tough in public, including the wife. And so everybody was strong and, and stalwart and no public expression of grief. Uh, then you may have the social hostess. And, and again, the line gets thin. It's nice to have someone who is capable of greeting people at the door. Uh, if you've got a family of 30 people, uh, they have to eat. The children are probably going to think this is the greatest party they've been to in quite a while. And so you get a real strange mix. You've got the core people who are close to the deceased, who are legitimately grieving and pained and working through this. But this may be the first time that all 15 little cousins under the age of seven have ever been together at the same time. They're having the time of their lives. Or they're all elementary age, they're all out of school, they've come a great distance, and here they are on grandpa's farm with more grass and more apple trees and more fun than they've ever had before. And so there's a balance that has to be maintained in there. Uh, we'll get later on to how you help families in times of bereavement, but yeah, Allison. Well, going back to the um, functions of a funeral, I have a question about why it is they separate the family over to a little side room that's looking like towards the casket, like straight in front of them, but they can't see anything, and then, you know, all the other people are over there. I mean, is that just out of respect or because uh, it was really annoying for me. I mean, okay. when my grandmother passed away, it was, I just felt, I mean, of course I was annoyed anyway, but it, it just was really weird, I thought. For we're coming up on break. Why don't you think about that while we're on our intermission and let's pick up with that because I don't think it has a quick and easy answer to it. And so let's start with exploring that and then we'll continue with uh, roles that people uh, provide at funerals.